Hi everyone! Today is all about growing tomatoes. I absolutely love the taste of a homegrown tomato. Don't you agree? Well, they come in all sorts of colors, shapes, and sizes. They're one of my very favorite vegetables to grow and one of the most popular ones for gardeners to grow all over the world. What I've done in today's video is compiled my past episodes on growing tomatoes so you have everything you need to grow them from seed to harvest in one place. So no more looking all over for the information you need. It's all right here. This video is a complete guide on how to grow tomatoes from a seed to harvest. You'll find information on starting them from seed indoors, getting them planted out in the garden, what to add to your tomato planting hole, watering, fertilizing, how to make a tomato DIY cage, harvesting tips, how to preserve them, and even a couple of my favorite tomato recipes at the very end. So stay tuned for that. To get the most out of this video, look at the digital table of contents in the video description and just click and watch the sections you're most interested in. No matter whether you like the giant beefsteak tomatoes or the small cherry tomatoes that produce a ton, when you're done watching this video, you'll know exactly how to grow them from seed to harvest, and you'll be harvesting and tasting your own fresh homegrown tomatoes before you know it. So when you're done watching this video, what I want you to do is go and get yourself some tomato seeds started. Now, if you need seeds, head over to my website, CallieKimGardenInHome.com. I have a tomato seed collection, five varieties, some classic varieties, and some fun ones too, to help you get started. So comment below, let me know what you learned, and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you at the end of the video. Well, today we're gonna to talk about planting tomatoes from seed indoors. If you're a beginning gardener and have always wanted to plant tomatoes from seed but are intimidated to do so, there's no reason to be intimidated. It's super easy, it's quick, and most of the time you can use materials that you already have around your own house. The big advantage that I like about starting my tomatoes from seed is that I can plant many different varieties, many different heirloom organic varieties that you wouldn't find at your normal big box store when you go to pick up those little tomato plant starts. So I would highly recommend it and you get some wonderful, different colored, wonderful tasting tomatoes when you start your plants from seed. So here's what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna plant about 15 varieties of tomatoes this year. Most of the tomatoes I'm starting from seed are plants that I've got, or seeds that I've gotten over the years from Baker Creek Seed Company. But I am gonna plant some new varieties to me this year that some viewers were generous enough to send me seeds for. These are from Charm City Balcony Gardens channel. She shared these seeds with me and I'm really excited to grow them. If you haven't checked her channel out, please go and do so. She's got a great channel on container gardening and she plants some amazing things in containers, so definitely check her out. The other couple of varieties I'm going to plant are from Praxis from his seed giveaway, which I know many of you probably participated in as well, and he sent some great seeds out this year, and I also have a packet left over from last year, which is my very favorite tomato so far. It's a yellow cherry. It's super sweet and delicious. So I'm really excited to get these seeds started. Let me show you how to get started. What I like to do is plant them in these little red Solo cups. Now, if you don't already have these around your house, you can buy a fairly large size pack at Target for around $4. You can get them anywhere, Walmart, wherever you happen to see these. Costco for a super duper big pack if you wanna plant a whole lot of seeds. But how I like to start is by, of course, putting a drainage hole in the bottom. Very important that you have adequate drainage for your plants. So, super simple, you take a nail, you take a hammer of some kind, and you simply pound a hole in the bottom, and there you have it. So easy, couldn't be easier. So. Then next you, want to, next you want to fill your cup about three quarters of the way full with soil. So I'm going to go ahead and fill this up. And I fill it about three quarters of the way full because I am going to add soil to this cup as the tomato seed grows. The reason why I do this is because tomatoes will put down roots wherever their stems touch the soil. So as they grow, I will add soil to the cup the tomatoes will put down roots along the stem and the tomato plant will be nice and strong before I transplant it out in the garden. So now for the seeds. The first seed I'm going to plant, and I am super excited about these tomatoes. I have heard so much about these. They're wonderful tomatoes, they're the San Marzano variety, and I'm really excited to plant these because I make a ton of spaghetti sauce out of my tomatoes. And from what I have heard, the San Marzano, Marzano 
is one of the best tomatoes, tasting tomatoes for spaghetti sauce. So I'm super excited to grow these for the first time this year in my garden. So all you need to do is pour a couple of seeds into your hand. And I'm gonna plant about four seeds in each little cup. You can see these seeds are super, super tiny. All you need to do is, where's my nail, is make a little indentation. I just like to plant two seeds on either side of the cup and that way you hope that one of them germinates. Usually I'll get two or three germinating per cup and then I can just take the strongest seedling and plant that one out in the garden. Okay, I just dropped my two little seeds into each hole. I'm gonna cover them up there and let me put these extra seeds back in the envelope. And then how I like to water them is I have this water bottle here, which I have filled with water, and I have uncapped it and let it sit for about 24 hours. And the reason why I do that is because it allows all the chlorine to evaporate out of the water, and it's a lot better for your plants if you're not putting chlorine onto them. So then what I do is I cap it, and this is so handy, you can leave it right next to your seedlings. And I've taken this nail and I just pound about three holes right into the lid. And it makes a little handy dandy waterer, your own little watering bottle for your plant. And then you can see it just waters it real gently. Get it nice and moist. Okay, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is definitely label the tomato variety that you planted because if you're planting a lot of varieties like me you're not going to remember so i'm just going to write on my cup san marzano and i like to write the date on here because uh, oops it's february because um i like to see how quickly they germinate and that way it lets me know when i can put them outside as well so we're going to set this here in this reflective aluminum foil baking pan maybe you have some of these around your house as well like i do and I'm gonna go ahead and get this pan planted out with the solo, red Solo Cups, and we'll be right back. Okay, I've got my tomato seeds started in my red Solo Cups here in this aluminum foil pan. And one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of the video, which is very important, is when to start your tomato seeds. Now, I like to start mine about eight weeks before I'm gonna put them out in the garden. And you wanna make sure you check your last frost date in your area and start them about eight weeks before that. But it's important not only to look at your last frost date, but what the average temperature is at nighttime around that time of the year where you're gonna be getting them into the ground. For example, I'm gonna plan on planting these in the ground around April 1st. Now we really don't get um, much frost around here except for very light frost, but around April 1st is when the nighttime temperatures start being around 50 degrees or higher. And tomatoes need warmer weather at night. And so that's a really good time to go ahead and get them planted into the ground. So these seedlings will grow and sprout probably in about a week or so. But until they do, I'm gonna make a little mini greenhouse here out of a couple of pieces of saran wrap. And all I'm gonna do is just Fold the saran wrap over this aluminum foil pan and that will keep the moisture and the temperature high underneath here and will help these little seeds germinate just a little bit quicker. So let me show you where, where I'm going to put this tray now to help my seeds germinate. Let's go into the kitchen. Okay, I like to put my tray of seeds on top of the refrigerator until they germinate with my little mini greenhouse cover here because it tends to be a little bit warmer on top of the refrigerator and I just think it kind of helps them along a little bit. Plus it just gets them out of my way. So there we have it. Take about a week for them to germinate. As soon as they germinate, you want to definitely take this cover off because otherwise they will get too hot and die. Now, let me show you where I like to put them after they germinate. 
Well, a lot of people use indoor grow lights or an indoor grow room for their seedlings, and I don't have any grow lights, so I just use what I have, and that's my south-facing window. This window gets a ton of sun, maybe eight hours a day. So this is where I keep all of my seedlings until they're ready to go outside into my mini greenhouse. And these tomatoes actually started on the 15th of January, which is about two weeks ago. They're already doing very well. So that's all there is to it. It's quick, simple, inexpensive way to start your tomato seeds indoors. So thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next time. Hi everyone. Well today I'm going to share with you three very simple ways that you can get indoor grow lights set up so that when it comes time to start your seeds inside for your spring garden in just a few months, you'll be ready. Now if you're one of those people who are confused about how to set up indoor grow lights, don't worry about it. You're not alone. In this video, we're going to break it down, make it very easy for you, including explaining what lumens and Kelvin are. So if you're confused about that, make sure you stay tuned. I'm going to show you my indoor grow light setup. And by the end of this video, you're going to know exactly how to get yours going inside as well. I know many of you are already dreaming about your spring garden and are busy picking out your seeds, planning what you're going to grow them in, and are going to get a head start by starting your seeds indoors. One of the most important factors to consider when growing indoor vegetable seedlings is light. It's so important to have the right kind of light to grow your plants healthy and strong so that they are ready to be planted outside when the time comes. Often a sunny windowsill is just not enough to grow strong, healthy seedlings. What the seedlings do is they stretch towards the sun and become leggy. And a leggy seedling is not a strong seedling. You want a seedling with a strong, stocky, healthy stem so that when it comes time to plant out in the garden, it is strong enough to withstand the wind and the elements and will grow you lots of wonderful vegetables for you and your family to eat. If you're going to take the time to start your vegetable seedlings indoors, the best way to make sure they are strong and healthy when it comes time to move them out into the garden is to grow them under indoor lights. You can't just use any old type of light bulb. You do need to use a special kind of light that has the right amount of Kelvin and lumens to grow your transplants healthy and strong. When you're shopping for indoor grow light bulbs, you'll often see three specifications on the package, lumens, Kelvin, and watts. It's really important to have the right amount of lumens and Kelvin so that your transplants go really nice and strong. So let's just break it down and make it very simple. Well, first of all, let's talk about lumens. Lumens is simply a measure of brightness of the light. The higher the lumens, the brighter the light. The lower the lumens, the dimmer the light. And when you're growing vegetable seedlings, it's very important that they're met with a very bright, intense light as soon as they germinate. So lumens are what pounds are to tomatoes, what a gallon is to milk. It's simply a way to measure the brightness of the light. So when you're growing vegetable seedlings, it's very important that you have about a 2,000 to 3,000 lumen level on your light bulb. And you can usually find this information on the back of the package. Now, this this particular light is a little bit under 2000, it's 1600, but I have used these lights many times to grow indoor vegetable seedlings, and although a brighter light would be a little bit better, these also work just fine. The next specification you'll find on the back of your grow light bulb package is Kelvin. Kelvin simply refers to the type of light produced or the color temperature, and grow lights need to mimic daylight. So the measurement on the back here shows 6,500, which is really good, between 4,500 and 6,500 mimic daylight. So again, the higher the number, the better. So look for a number between 45 and 6,500 so that your seedlings are nice and strong and stocky. The third specification, one that many of you are probably already familiar with, is watts. Now, like I mentioned earlier, watts is simply a measurement of the electricity used. So you really don't need to be too concerned about that when you're purchasing bulbs for growing indoors. Really the lumens and the Kelvin are the most important thing to look for so that your seedlings are nice and strong. There's many ways to set up indoor grow lights. So let's head inside. I'll show you the three really simple ways that I have mine set up and you can choose which one works best for you. The first indoor grow light is one of my favorites because it's so simple and perfect for a beginner. It's this very easy clamp light. Now I love this. No assembly required. The light bulb just screws in and out. Perfect for a small space. It'll clip under your countertop, onto a table, onto a shelf. And these are readily available. You can find them at hardware stores, Target, or Walmart. I'll also pop a link down in the video description. Now, how I'm using it here is I've got a gallon jug filled with sand, PVC pipe in it, clip it on, turn it on, and there you go. You got an instant grow light system. 
You can move it up and down as the plants grow. A couple little tips here. In this clamp light, I'm using one of these CFL bulbs that I showed you earlier. You can also use an LED bulb, but keep in mind, although that's more energy efficient in the long run, your upfront costs will be higher. So I'm keeping my costs really low up front by using the CFL bulbs, and these work just great. Now, the thing to remember when you're growing indoor plants with your grow lights is to keep your grow light about an inch or two away from the plants that you're growing. Otherwise, we get that legginess I told you about earlier, and we don't want that because we want our seedlings to be nice and strong. So you can direct the light up and down, and it's perfect for growing this nice little tray of microgreens. I mean, look at these. Don't these look fabulous? Now, another way I really like to use this clamp light, a lot of you have done this from the first garden series or from the $10 garden series, is with a grow light box. Now, this is so handy. It keeps all your seedlings contained in this box. And you may have seen this also over on Gary, over at the Rusted Gardens channel. I got the idea originally from him. I'll put a pop-up link on, to a video on how to build it. But basically, it's just lined with aluminum foil, and the clamp light keeps the light directed right down onto the seedlings. So it's a really handy way to get started, and it's very inexpensive. The second setup that I love to use is this shop light setup. Now you need two things for this, a four foot shop light and then some bulbs. Now you can use T8 light bulbs or T5 light bulbs, but I happen to have bought a big contractor's pack of the T12, so I'm gonna use what I have. Now the T12, T5, and T8, don't let that confuse you, it simply refers to the size or the diameter of the light bulb. So the T12s and the T8s work great. The T5s, the light is a lot more intense, but those light bulbs are also more expensive. So I'm sticking with the T12s for now. One thing I forgot to mention about these T12 lights, 2,500 lumens, so we're good on the lumens, and the Kelvins are 500K. So we're good on both lumens and Kelvin with these T12 lights. So this is super easy to get set up. You can set it up on a nice shelving unit or in a closet on shelves if you have that available to you. But I have just set it up super simple, super quick. Again, I've got my gallon jugs here filled with sand, PVC pipe stuck in the middle, and I use the little chains that come with the shop lights just to hang them from the PVC pipes and direct the light down towards my plants. Now, you'll see, of course, that I raise my plants up with these shoe boxes while they're teeny tiny, a couple of bricks, because remember, you don't want your plants to be what? To be leggy, that's right, you guys are learning. And as the plants grow, I can move the bricks out of the way, move the shoe boxes out of the way, so that um, there's enough room for the plants underneath the light. So this may not be a super pretty setup, but it's a setup that you can easily do at home. It's very inexpensive, and you can get those spring garden seeds started. The third indoor grow light setup that I really like to use is this really simple tabletop grow light setup. This one's made by Fairy Morris, so you can get it at most hardware stores. And I'll also link it up in the video description. It comes in this nice, neat little package. So the advantage to this is, if you're a beginner, everything is in here. You got the light, you got the little handy dandy stand. Does require some assembly, but it pretty much takes the guesswork out of it. Now this one has one of those T5 bulbs I was telling you about. It doesn't specify the lumens and the Kelvin on the package, but it's a nice, bright, intense light. And let me just show you how much smaller the T5 bulb is as compared to the T12 bulb that I used in the, in the previous setup. It's a lot more uh, smaller in diameter. So this little setup is about two feet long, and it works great, again, if you're growing a small amount of plants. It's growing this lettuce little salad container of lettuce greens absolutely beautifully. Now, the cool thing is, too, if you have two of them, you can kind of put them together here. It does interlock really nicely and that way it provides a lot of really nice, intense light for your plants. Now, the only drawback to this is they're a little bit pricey. I think these run around $45 or so on Amazon or at your hardware store. So if you're on a tight budget, you might wanna start with one of the other two setups and then move up to this one if your budget allows. Well, the other thing that's really important when you're doing an indoor grow light setup is to have a timer. It's super important that you don't have to think about when to turn your lights on and turn them off, because if you forget, again, your plants won't have enough light and they're going to be leggy. <laughs> you guys are doing really good on this. Now, the amount of time that you leave your indoor grow lights on is this. 
When you first start your seedlings, they're gonna take a couple of days to germinate. But I like to leave mine on about 24 hours until they germinate. So just in case those little seedlings poke through the soil when you're in bed, they're gonna be met by a super bright burst of intense light. And that way they'll keep on growing nice and strong. And after that, after they germinate, you wanna leave them on about 18 hours a day and off for about six hours during the night. So the schedule of 18 hours on and six hours off is just the right amount to grow nice, strong, healthy seedlings. So that pretty soon when the weather warms up and you're ready to put them in the garden, they are gonna be ready. Well, there you have it. Three super simple, easy, quick, simple, inexpensive indoor grow light setups and Kelvin and Lumens Explained. Well, comment below, let me know if this video was helpful for you and what type of indoor grow light setup you're gonna be using to grow your spring vegetable seedlings. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the videos and hit the like button if you liked it because that always really helps me out. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Hi everyone, well today we're gonna to talk about how to grow tomatoes. Tomatoes are the queen of the garden in my opinion and this is a very highly requested video. We're gonna talk about the sun that tomatoes like, the type of spacing that they need in order to thrive and get a wonderful harvest. And I'm gonna give you some very special tomato planting hole recipe tips for your tomato soil to be nice and fertile so you'll get a big abundant crop. Well, if you're like me, you love to grow fresh tomatoes in your garden because the taste of homegrown tomatoes simply cannot be beat. Once you've had your own homegrown tomato, you just cannot go back to store-bought tomatoes. And today we're going to be planting an Amish paste tomato. It's a delicious red Roma tomato. It's great for making spaghetti sauces, tomato paste, but it's also wonderful for fresh eating. Well, it's easy to get your own delicious crop of beautiful tomatoes as long as you follow a very few simple tips. The first one is they like to grow in full sun. So you want to pick a sunny location in your garden and I picked this corner of my garden because it's the last corner to lose light at the end of the day. It's going to get about 8 to 10 hours of day in the summertime. It'll be perfect for growing my tomato plant. So make sure you plant yours in full sun as well. The second tip that you want to do when planting your tomato is giving it the proper soil requirements. Tomatoes are very heavy, heavy feeders and I have a special tomato planting hole recipe that I'm going to share with you today that will help you to grow a prolific crop of tomatoes in your garden this summer. So by the way, if you aren't yet a subscriber to my channel, would you do me a favor and subscribe? That way you don't miss any garden updates. Now back to planting the tomato. I've dug my hole and I've dug my hole nice and deep. You definitely want it at least the depth of the tomato that you're planting. So this will be perfect for this tomato. Now for my tomato planting hole recipe. There's lots of different things you can put in a tomato planting hole. These are just a few of the things that I really like. The first thing is coffee grounds. And I'm just gonna put about a fourth a cup of coffee grounds. I'm gonna mix everything up in this little aluminum foil pie plate. So about a fourth a cup of coffee grounds and that just adds some good organic matter to the soil. Helps aerate it, helps with water retention. It just really, really makes the tomatoes grow nicely. The second thing I'm gonna add is ground up eggshells. And these are ground up very finely in my coffee grinder and these add calcium to the soil. And I like to grind them up finely rather than crush them because then they'll be better absorbed into the soil quickly by the tomato plant. And the third thing I like to add, which is kind of my secret ingredient, is powdered milk. Now, that seems, it might seem like kind of a strange thing to add, but I actually had it in my tomato plants a couple of years ago in my planting hole, and I had the best tomatoes I've ever had that year. It adds some really nice calcium to the tomatoes, and sometimes they have a tough time taking up calcium from the soil. That's why they tend to get blossom end rot, which is that ugly, brown, unsightly spots that you sometimes get on the bottom of your tomatoes, and the eggshells and the calcium really seem to do the trick. The last thing I like to add is Epsom salt. Now, I add a couple of tablespoons spoons of Epsom salt to my recipe and this just helps them um, with the magnesium sulfate and it makes them nice and green and it makes them produce a really nice crop of tomatoes for you. So there you go, my tomato hole planting recipe. I'm going to add in first before I add this, a couple of handfuls of compost so that has plenty of good food and soil to get started with. Just dump that in, just a couple good handfuls in there. And then I'm gonna add my tomato planting hole mix. 
Well, because the compost I added to my tomato planting hole is very dry, I'm gonna go ahead and pre-moisten it with my hose. If your soil is already nice and moist, you can completely skip this step. Our soil is prepared. We got our tomato planting hole ready. Let's get this tomato in the ground. You can see how deep I've dug this hole and how far around I've dug it because I want the soil around the tomato to be nice and loose. Now something interesting about a tomato is it will put down roots wherever the stem touches the soil. So that's why we're planting it so deep. So I'm just gonna squeeze it out of this cup here. I have it in. I started this from seed a couple of months ago. It's definitely ready to go into the ground. You can see how the roots are starting to wrap around. It's starting to get just a little bit root bound. So we're going to put it in the hole here, loosen up the roots just a little bit so they can have a good head start. And I want to make sure that I take all of these stems or all of these extra leaves off the stem because we're going to be covering it with soil about up to the top set of leaves. We don't want these stems rotting in the soil or splashing up. Um, onto the soil and getting blight and having our tomatoes start off with a disease. We definitely don't want that. So we've got it in our hole. Now all I have to do is fill in with a little bit more compost and some of the soil that I already dug out of this hole. Give it some good nutrients. Okay, now let's talk about how to water your tomato plant. Now tomatoes like to get off to a good start with a really good high nitrogen fertilizer. I like to use a fish fertilizer even though it smells really bad. It's good for your tomato plants, gives them a good boost of nitrogen which provides them with a lot of green growth at the beginning of the season. You want your tomato plants to grow nice and green at first so they have a nice structure so they'll be able to hold all those beautiful tomatoes that you're gonna be growing. So I give them a nice drink of this to start them off. They'll have a lot of green growth at the beginning of the season. And then after about a month or so, I back off on this and just feed them Epsom salts about once a month throughout the season. And I like to water them nice and deeply, about 30 minutes, twice a week. But again, it depends on how hot it is where you live. You might need to water them a little bit more often if it gets super, super hot. We've talked about the sun, the soil, and the water requirements that tomatoes like. Let's talk about the spacing. When you're planting them in your garden and putting them in a row, you wanna make sure you plant them at least two feet apart. They need plenty of room to vine out, to grow all the beautiful tomatoes that you're gonna be harvesting and taking indoors, but they also like a lot of air circulation so they don't get diseases. So very important that you don't plant them any closer than two feet apart. So the only thing that I didn't cover in this video is how to support, try or cage your tomato plants and you want to tune in for part two of how to grow a tomato which we'll be posting in about a week and I'm going to give you some very easy DIY ideas that you can cage or trellis your tomato plant so make sure you stay tuned for that so please comment below let me know if you're growing tomatoes in your garden what your favorite variety is to grow thank you so much for watching we'll see you on the next video two rows of pellets full of onion seeds and she wanted some extra lettuce yep. so she planted a little bit of extra lettuce and don't worry if you get a few extra seeds in there it's no big deal we'll probably plant some lettuce out in the garden too at a later date or in a container that works really good in containers too hi everyone welcome back to the ten dollar garden series where we're growing our own food in a quick simple and inexpensive way well today we're going to build ourselves some tomato cages now, why build your own as opposed to just purchase them from the garden center? Well, the ones you buy at the garden center are just not tall enough and sturdy enough to grow all those tomatoes that you're gonna be growing with your $10 garden seed kit. So I'm gonna show you how to make some today. It's gonna to be quick, it's gonna be simple, and it's gonna save you money. Here's the cage that we're gonna be making today. I've used this cage in my garden for about four to five years. Really, really like it. It's super sturdy, enough to hold the weight of a fully loaded tomato. And the great thing is they're easy to make. They're about five feet tall, 18 inches in diameter, but you can also customize it to fit your own garden space. So let me show you the supplies that we're gonna need. We're only going to use four supplies to make our tomato cages. We're keeping it quick, we're keeping it simple, and we're keeping it inexpensive. The first thing we're going to need is a roll of welded wire fencing. Now this has two inch by four inch squares. It's 14 gauge wire. It's five foot tall and this is a 50 foot roll, which should make us about 10 to 12 tomato cages. And you can always split it with a friend to save yourself even more money. 
Need some cable ties. These are seven inches long, a pair of tin snips, and a measuring tape. That's it. The first thing I'm going to do is to unroll this fencing and cut it into lengths. Next, I'm gonna cut my fencing into 60 inch lengths, and that will give me a cage that's about 18 inches or so in diameter. Next, we're gonna hook it together with cable ties. Before we hook it together with cable ties, we're gonna cut off these wires that are sticking out. Now, you may wonder, why not just hook it together with the wires? Well, I like to be able to easily store these flat at the end of the season. And when you hook it together with the cable ties, you can just snip the cable ties, lay them out flat, and store it in your garage or your tool shed. If you hooked it together with the wires, it would be too hard to take apart. And make sure you wear your gloves and your safety glasses so you don't get hurt. Next, I'm gonna attach my cage together with cable ties. Now I am gonna take my gloves off at this point to make it easier to work with the cable ties, but I do like to start with the middle of the cage, attaching that first, and just feed the cable tie under and up. Pull it as tight as you can. Then I'm gonna start at the top and attach a cable tie at every other section. This is exciting, it's starting to look like a tomato cage. It's nice and sturdy. Just gonna clip off the end of all my cable ties. And we are just about ready to plant us some tomatoes. Next, I'm gonna take my cage, set it on end, and I'm gonna cut the little feet that will go into the ground and give it some stability. So I'm gonna take my tin snips, I'm gonna start at the spot where I connected the cage together, and I'm just gonna snip the wire here. So I went every other section, and what I'm gonna to do to make my little feet is I'm just gonna bend this part up, and this is the part that's gonna go into the ground. Again, bend it up. And do this all around the cage. We'll have a nice, sturdy tomato cage. Okay, there we go. We have the bottom of our cage all set. Now, you might be wondering, how in the world are you gonna pick tomatoes? These holes are too small to fit my hands in. Well, what I like to do, and I'm sure there's many ways to do this, but I like to cut some hand holes here in my tomato cage. So not only does this help me be able to reach in and access my tomatoes, if I need to tend to them or fertilize them or anything like that, but it also helps me be able to pick them. So I'm just gonna cut some little holes here in my cage with my tin snips. And you can totally do this however you want, whatever size you want the holes, and however many you want. So you really, at this point, could just customize it to fit your needs. There we go, that looks good. I'm just gonna cut these every so often throughout the cage, and then we're gonna be all set. Now you may wanna take a pair of pliers and bend this sharp edge back so no one gets hurt, but you can see you can easily put your hand through, pick your tomatoes, trim your tomatoes, whatever you wanna do, and I always usually add a few more holes as my tomato grows just so I can pick them a little bit easier. Now our cage is ready to plant a tomato. Now we're not gonna plant it today, but make sure you subscribe because we will be planting our $10 garden tomatoes very soon. Here I just have a little seedling that I've had going for a couple of months. And you can see how nicely this cage is gonna fit over this tomato once it's in the ground. And it's gonna give it a lot of nice support when it's laden with fruit. I cannot wait to see all those tomatoes to pick my very first ripe tomato of the season to take it inside and make something healthy and delicious for my family. It's gonna be so much fun.
If you haven't yet started seeds for your spring garden, it's not too late to start. You want to go back and watch the previous videos in this series so you know exactly what to do. If you need seeds, there'll be a link on the screen on where you can get the $10 garden seed kit for 10% off. And also make sure you check out my ebook, Growing Five Warm Weather Vegetables Made Easy, because one of the featured vegetables is tomatoes, and you're going to need to know exactly how to grow them. Comment below and let me know how your seedlings are doing from the $10 Garden Seed Kit and what you're excited about for your spring garden. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Hi everyone, well it's tomato planting time and today we're gonna to talk about three DIY ways that you can support cage and trellis your tomato plants. Now the first one, a very simple idea, is just a simple six foot pole put in the ground next to your tomato plant and all you have to do is just tie your tomato plant to it as it grows. The second one being these tomato cages here, which I'll put a pop-up link to how I made those. And these have held up really well, simply made out of wire fencing from the hardware store. They've held up well for me for about four years, but I'm ready for something a whole lot sturdier. The next one being a trellis made out of a cattle panel. And you guys know how much I love these cattle panels. I built this cattle panel trellis last summer and trellised my watermelon up it and used it for a hoop house over the winter time. It's super sturdy holds up to the winds, takes a beating like nothing else I've ever seen, and today I'm gonna to show you how to make a tomato trellis out of a cattle panel. So let's get started. Well, first of all, let me talk about the materials that you're gonna to need to make yourself a really sturdy cattle panel tomato trellis. First off, you're gonna need a cattle panel. Now, these are widely available at different hardware stores across the country. I get mine at Lowe's. I know other people have mentioned Tractor Supply has them as well. You're gonna need yourself two six-foot T-posts, and I'm gonna use some bale wire to attach the cattle panel to the T-posts, and a hacksaw to cut the cattle panel. So let's get started. Okay, well this is a 4 by 16 foot cattle panel, 4 gauge wire, which is used in agricultural fencing, super sturdy, will hold up to the winds, and camera guy's helping me out today by cutting through it with a hacksaw. If you have the heavy duty tools, then by up. all means, go for it. Hey, that wasn't bad at all. If you have the heavy duty tools, by all means, go for it, and it won't take you long at all to cut through this cattle panel. We're going to go ahead and get it cut, and then we'll come back and show you the next step. Well, we flip the cattle panel so we can cut through the last wire on the top. And some of you have asked, why don't you use power tools in some of your projects? Well, we don't have any power tools. We're old school. And anyway, who needs power tools when we have camera guy? Right, camera guy? Yeah. <laughs> All right, nice job. We got it done. And camera guy got his workout too. So this is our working piece. Let's go put up our tomato cattle panel trellis. All right. Sounds good. Nothing like snacking in the garden. I just love these cattle panel trellises. They're so sturdy. This is going to be plenty strong to hold up all the tomatoes I'm going to grow from the plant we planted on last week's video. We've had a problem in the past few years of the high winds we have here blowing over tomato cages. So I'm really looking forward to these sturdy T-posts doing the trick with my cattle panel tomato trellis. So just to give you an idea of what we're doing today, basically I've got my little tomato plant here that I just planted last week, and believe it or not, it will grow up to fill this trellis. So I've just stood the cattle panel up on its end, so it's six feet tall, right in front of the tomato plant. I'm gonna pound in the T-posts and attach the cattle panel. While camera guy helps me hold up the cattle panel, we're gonna get these T-posts pounded in. And I'm pounding it in two wire lengths over, just to give it some extra stability. And these are six feet tall, so this is gonna be a bit of a challenge to get up this high, but we can do it. Almost done. And we are pounding the T-post in all the way to the T to give us some extra stability because we want this cage to be super, super sturdy. All that's left to do is bring over our cattle panel, put it in place, and attach it with a bale wire. Okay, I've got my bale wire. I'm going to cut off about a foot length with my wire cutters here. And just go behind to wrap it around. 
very easy to do. Anyone can do this, don't need any special tools. Just put my wire around my cattle panel, wrap it around my T-post, pull it as tight as I can and just do a couple twists. And there you go. This is so sturdy. I cannot wait to see this filled with beautiful tomatoes. Okay, got this finished twisting around here. Just gonna cut off the extra and bend down the sharp edges so nobody gets hurt on this. All right, beautiful. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get the rest of the wire wrapped around and finish this up. So there you have it. I have my cattle panel tomato trellis built. Really easy to build. I'm really excited to see this filled with tomatoes. I think it'll be a whole lot sturdier than cages and stakes I've used in the past. And I also want to let you guys know some really exciting information. I've started a gardening blog, CallieKimGardenInHome.com. So head on over there to check it out. The link will be in the description box. We'll put a pop-up link above here in the video. It's gonna be some great in-depth gardening information over there. Some of my personal thoughts and musings from the garden, some testimonials from you guys about how gardening has changed your life. So once you get over there, make sure you sign up because there's a really wonderful growing guide that you can download three vegetables you can grow in six weeks. It's full color, it's absolutely beautiful. We worked hard on it and are very proud of it. It's gonna give you some great information to grow three easy vegetables in your garden. So thank you so much for heading over to check it out. Let me know what you think about it. And thank you so much for watching. I hope you're able to grow a lot of great, beautiful, wonderful tomatoes in your garden. We'll see you guys on the next video. Nice drink of this to start them off have a lot of green growth at the beginning of the season and then after about a month or so I back off on this and just feed them Epsom salts about once a month throughout the season and I like to water them nice and hi everyone here is Callie Kim's two minute tip for today tomatoes we all love growing lots and lots of tomatoes but sometimes we as gardeners aren't sure how to keep that tomato production going even during the hot hot summer months Today I'm going to share with you three tips to grow lots and lots of tomatoes even during the summer heat. Tip one, give your plants a mid-season boost by feeding them. Spread some compost around the base of your plants and water it in with your favorite liquid fertilizer. This will give them the nutrients they need to keep producing lots of tomatoes the rest of the summer and well into the fall. Tip two, hand pollinate your tomatoes. A tomato flower has both male and female parts all in one flower. You can easily pollinate your tomatoes simply by shaking your plant. This moves the pollen around, helps it set more fruit, which gives you a lot more tomatoes. Tip three, provide your tomato plants with some shade. Tomato flowers tend to dry up and drop off when the weather hits 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Drape a shade cloth over your plant to help protect it from the sun's rays. This keeps the flowers from drying up and keeps your tomatoes producing. Now you don't want a cloth that completely blocks out the sun rays. This one is about a 40% shade cloth, which is perfect to still allow some sunlight through and keep your tomato plant producing for you. By following these three tips, feeding your tomato plants, hand pollinating them, and providing them with some shade during the hottest parts of the summer, you'll be growing lots and lots of fresh, tasty tomatoes all summer long and well into the fall. Subscribe, share, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you on the next Cali Kim 2 Minute Tip. Hi everyone, well I've got my ladder out today because I've got a big tall tomato plant to trim up and I want to give my tomato plant an end of the season kind of boost to get it pumping again because it stopped producing and this one's my favorite, it's my Kellogg's breakfast tomato. Well this Kellogg's breakfast plant has actually been in my garden for almost a year and I've been enjoying a harvest off of it for a long time. You guys have seen a lot of the pictures over on Instagram and I know a lot of you guys have been harvesting your tomatoes all season long and loving those harvests but you know what at the end of the season the tomatoes just start the production just starts slowing down and it's good to give them a little boost to get them pumping again. We've got a few more months of warm weather and this will help hopefully give me some tomatoes into the fall. But the first thing I'm going to do is trim this up. Now this plant is ginormous. It's probably at least 10 or 12 feet tall and the first thing I'm going to do is just cut off some of these brown leaves, some of the diseased leaves, get all that stuff out of there because we want all the energy to go into producing fruit. I'm even going to top off some of the branches so not as much energy is going into 
producing green leaves, but into producing the beautiful tomatoes that I want. So let's go ahead and get this baby trimmed up. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is just top off these big long branches here, because these really are not producing any fruit, and that way more energy goes into fruit production. So I'm just gonna snip off these branches that are sticking up above this trellis. You can see there's some brown and some yellow leaves. And I'll go ahead and cut those off the bottom branches. First, I'm just going to snip off all these branches. Okay, I've got this pretty much topped off how I want it. And next, I want to go through and just cut off the little dead and dry leaves here. And any leaves that are yellowing or spotted, that means they have some kind of disease. So I want to get those all trimmed up as well. And I like to cut as close, see if I can find one here as close to the stem as possible. So here's like a little brown leaf here. I'm gonna cut really close to the stem. That way it gives a nice clean cut and gets everything off, there, off of it that I possibly can that might be dried and diseased. So I'm just gonna go through and do all that to this whole plant. It's gonna be nice and green instead of yellow and brown and that'll really help it start producing. So I've got the yellow and brown leaves cut off and that is definitely gonna help put more energy into fruit production for this tomato plant. But I haven't fertilized it for a while. If I wanted to keep producing, I need to give it a little boost of extra nutrients to help it get those good tomatoes rolling again like I really want for a couple more months. So let me just tell you what I like to do for my boost. I like to keep it really simple and just use ingredients that I have on hand. Now if you live in the Southern Hemisphere and you're just planting for the season, you can use some of these ingredients, but you want to add a couple of more. So you want to go over and check out my How to Grow Lots of Tomatoes video to give you that tomato planting whole recipe. But what I like to use for an end of the season boost is very simple. I like to use Epsom salt and some organic fertilizer. So here I've got my Epsom salt and what I do is I just like to scratch some into the bottom of my tomato plant here. So I just kind of loosen up the soil, pull back the mulch that I have, and just throw in a handful of Epsom salt. Maybe just a couple of tablespoons. You don't really have to measure anything. It's not an exact science. And definitely some good organic fertilizer. Use what you have on hand, but I really like to use Trifecta Plus, which is in my gardener's fertilizer. And one reason I like to use it is because it has both slow acting nutrients, which will feed your tomato plant for a couple of months and quick, act, quick acting nutrients, which will get it going right away. So I just add maybe a fourth a cup or so to the bottom of the plant. And I actually put a link in the video description on where you can get Trifecta Plus on his website. You get a 10% discount if you go through the link I'm gonna put in the video description. And all I do is I just kind of rub it in here, scratch it in to the base of the plant. Super easy, super quick. So give it that boost it needs to get some more production going here. And then the last thing I like to do, which I love to water my plants with this, is compost tea. Now compost tea is great because if you make your own compost, it's free. Super easy with my little bucket brewed steeped method. Go back and catch that video. I'll put a little pop-up link. I've got some here in my watering can. So I just want to water in these little nutrients I just put into the soil here. I like to kind of get a little puddle going there and then let it soak in so it gets way down into the roots because it wants that nice deep watering. So we'll let that soak in. We'll give it some more water so the roots get nice and wet. Those nutrients soak down in there and hopefully this will get this tomato plant going again. I love this as my Kellogg's breakfast plant and I'm probably going to try and keep this going over the winter time. We like to put plastic over this trellis here and make a hoop house out of it. You might have caught our hoop house series last winter. Plan on doing that again and hopefully I can keep this tomato plant going all winter long. So I'll definitely come back and show you the progress of this another month or so. Hopefully I'll have some nice tomatoes to show you at that time too. So thank you so much for watching. Make sure you use this in your garden to get your tomato plants going again and let me know how it goes in the comments below. So head on over to visit my website. I have a great ebook over there on how to grow some warm weather vegetables. If you're just starting to grow your warm weather vegetables in the southern hemisphere, you definitely want to check that out. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. And soil to get started with. Just dump that in. Just a couple good handfuls in there. And then I'm gonna add my tomato planting hole mix. 
Hi everyone, here's Callie Kim's two minute tip for today. Tomatoes, one of the most popular vegetables to grow. But at this point in the summer, your tomatoes might be getting yellow or brown leaves or have common diseases such as blight, leaf spot, or leaf curl. So today I'm gonna to share with you a tip on helping to control those diseases on your tomato plants. The best thing you can do to control diseases on your tomato plants is to keep the bottom four to six inches trimmed and free of leaves. Now this tomato plant behind me is pretty bushy, needs some trimming down, so let's get in here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. A tomato diseases such as blight, leaf spot, leaf curl, thrive in moist, damp environments when the, there's not a lot of airflow. So trim the leaves off the bottom four to six inches of your plant to keep it dry and increase the airflow and stop the diseases from spreading. If you see any yellowing or brown leaves, cut them off. Don't worry about it, your plant can handle it. So you can see that just by removing some bottom leaves from that tomato plant, there's much more airflow, which is definitely gonna help control the disease on this plant. The other thing you wanna do is to check your plant daily to see if you have any spotted, yellowing, or brown leaves and remove them right away so it doesn't spread to the rest of the plant. So this plant actually looks very, very healthy, but I do have this leaf here that has some spotting on it. So I'm just gonna go in here and clip off this branch and remove it, and that way it doesn't spread to the rest of the plant. And these leaves, I am not going to compost, but I'm gonna get rid of them in my green trash can because they do carry spores from the fungus and bacteria, and I definitely don't want that spreading to the rest of my garden. Don't let your tomato branches touch the ground because then water can splash up on the leaves and cause diseases. Tie it up. Problem solved. Now remember, keep the bottom four to six inches of your tomato plant trimmed. Check your plant to see if there's leaves that need to be removed and tie up those branches that are touching the ground. And this will help control the tomato diseases on your plants this summer. Subscribe, share, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next Cali Kim Two Minute Tip. Well, this is my trouble tomato plant. It's the early girl, it was my first plant in. It just fell over. It's gotten eaten by rats as the tomatoes get ripe. This thing is so heavy. I don't know how I'm gonna get this up again. Oh man. We got a problem on our hands today. Hi everyone. Well, this tomato plant was the first tomato I planted this year and it's so stinking heavy with fruit that it just toppled over a few days ago. Having a lot of fruit is a great thing, but we got to figure out how to get it to stand up. The tomato cage just didn't support it. In fact, <laughs> this is so fun. Even though it fell over, <laughs> it's got a couple ripe tomatoes on it that the rats haven't eaten yet. Because that was another problem we had is the rats were eating all these tomatoes as they got ripe. So here we've got a couple beautiful looking tomatoes. It's loaded, absolutely loaded with green tomatoes that I want to turn red, but I can't handle this one on my own. I'm gonna get camera guy, my husband, to help me out with this. I'm really happy. I think we're gonna be able to save this plant. Remember, this was a plant rescue, so it ain't gonna be pretty. And the reason why I wanted to save it, this plant is absolutely loaded with tomatoes. I mean, you guys can't even see them all on camera. They're in the middle, they're in the back, they're on the front, they're up and down the whole entire plant. It's amazing, and look at all that we picked today. And it fell on the ground just from lifting the plant up. We've got red ones, we've got green ones. Can you tell you guys I'm really excited about all these tomatoes? And by the way, I'm gonna ripen up the green ones in the house in a paper sack. It works great. But let me show you what we did here, okay? We took four poles rather than two and we pulled the plant up by the cage, wrapped some bale wire around the four poles to form a teepee system, and then looped the cage with wire to hold it up to support the plant. And honestly, guys, it looks pretty sturdy. I think it's gonna hold. I think we're gonna be able to save this plant. And you know what? This cage system just is not working for me. We've had these cages for three years, and I'm ready to try something else. So you're gonna to have to tune in this winter to find out what it is. Hope you guys enjoyed our tomato cage collapse rescue. Thanks a lot for watching. We'll see you guys on the next video.
guys, come on, you gotta see what's down here. This is, oh man, I can't believe this. Come check it out. Come on. Okay. I'm gonna give you a couple clues, see if you can guess what it is. Believe me, I'm not happy about this. Okay, right here. Black spots, black droppings, they're all over this plant. Okay. Everybody know what that is so far? Okay, wait till you see this. Look at these, look at this plant, totally stripped, completely stripped of leaves. And here we are guys. If you guessed the dreaded tomato hornworm, you were right. Look at how big this guy is. Look at that horn right there. And you know what? All these, a lot of these leaves are stripped. Look at all these. Stripped, 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 stripped leaves. These guys just chow down. And what's more, oh my gosh, look at this. Another one. Right here, two on this plant. They are literally eating this plant alive. Okay, if you've never seen one of these guys before, let me tell you, they are without a doubt the ugliest garden bug ever and probably the most destructive. They are not doing this plant any good and I've got to get rid of them. Let me show you what I do to get rid of these guys. Okay, the only way I found to get rid of these guys, sprays don't work, powders don't work that I found. The only way I found to get rid of these guys is to actually pick them off because I can't stand to squish them. What I do, I put them in a jar and let them suffocate, all right? Now this might seem mean, but these guys are eating my plants. They are nasty. So I'm gonna pick this baby off and I can't stand to touch them, so I've got to wear my gloves here. Ooh, this guy's disgusting. And when you pick them off, we're going to want to get a close-up of this. They squirt out this really disgusting green goo. Okay, I don't know if this guy will do it or not, but let's give it a try. It's kind of their defense mechanism. Oh, look at this guy. Look at him. Look at him. Okay. He's going in the jar, guys. Right in there. And so is his friend. Got his friend right up here. Oh, that's gross. Oh, <laughs> dropped him. Here they go. They can die together. The lid goes on. <laughs> There we go, guys. Now, believe it or not, this is about the uh, fourth and fifth one I have picked off my plants over the past couple of days. The only way I have found is manual control. You just come out here, look for these guys, look for the clues, and pick these babies off your plants. Hey, if you guys have found any better ways to get rid of these tomato hornworms, please let me know because I would love to hear it. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in for this short little video. Thanks a lot for watching. I really hope I get rid of these guys. We'll see you next time. Oh, these are so disgusting. Ugh. Hi everyone. We recently had a triple digit heat wave here in Southern California, which is pretty hot for us here. You might have seen on my recent garden tour video that some of my tomato plants got a little fried, unfortunately. We were away on vacation, covered them with shade cloth, but the heat was just so intense. Well, today I wanna to share with you a few tips for reviving a tomato plant after a heat wave to get it producing again. These will also be good tips for you if you're looking for a good end of the season tomato boost for one last hurrah before the weather gets cold. Reviving your tomato plants after a long hot summer can easily be done in three simple steps. Harvesting, trimming, and fertilizing. Now I harvested the tomatoes from this plant just before we left, and I do have a few on here to harvest today, but tomatoes do not like to set fruit or ripen in weather that's over 90 degrees. So there's not much on, on here right now due to the hot weather. We'll harvest what we have. Now this one is a little bit of a funny shape and color, most likely due to the heat. So we'll definitely take that one off. 
And I think there's maybe just one other tomato in here. This is a very, very small one. So you can see my tomato plant definitely needs a good boost. There's also several green tomatoes on here. So hopefully by giving this plant a boost, the weather is also now cooling off into the 80s, which is a perfect temperature for these tomatoes to set fruit and to ripen. We've done our first step, harvesting. It's a pretty pitiful little harvest, but harvesting is important because then all the energy of the plant can go into producing new tomatoes. So the second step, trimming, is actually done for the same reason. You wanna take off anything that's brown, this is all heat damage, anything that's yellow or spotted, which is disease, and basically we'll get this plant looking better again so all the energy can go into producing new leaves and new fruit. I'm always amazed what a simple thing like trimming off all the dead and yellowing leaves can do to the life of your tomato plant. Now when I trim, what I like to do is I have a brown leaf here, a brown branch basically, and I want to trim it as close to the main tomato stem as possible so I'm taking off the entire branch that's diseased without harming the main stem. Got most of the front of the plant trimmed. Now I came around the back. You don't want to forget the back of your plant. You really do not want to leave any brown or any yellowing leaves on. You don't want those um, yellowing spotted leaves to spread to the rest of the, your plant because they will spread very easily, especially when your plant is a little bit old and tired. It's a lot more susceptible to disease. So just take it all off and you will be amazed at how your plant will bounce back. I've got all the brown, yellowing, and spotted leaves trimmed off my tomato plant. What a difference. It looks so much nicer, so much more airflow. I also trimmed off leaves from the bottom six inches of the plant, again, to help with airflow. Now, the reason why airflow is so important is because you don't want your tomatoes getting diseases. When everything is crowded in there, the diseases tend to multiply. So another thing I did is I tied up any branches that were kind of hanging over like this one using my favorite stretchy tie tape. I love this stuff. So I'll just tie these last two up right here. Now by tying up these branches, you're also helping the plant have better airflow, avoiding diseases. Plus I just think it makes your plant look a whole lot nicer as well. Now you can see all these branches I trimmed off that were dead, old, diseased leaves. Now this tomato plant was trying to support this old growth. Now, it's just trying to support new growth and new fruit, which is gonna give it a huge boost and get it producing again. The third step to giving your tomatoes a boost at the end of the season is to fertilize them. Now, if you're new to my channel or even if you've been a subscriber for a while, you wanna go back and watch the Feeding Your Garden series that I did in the spring. Feeding your garden with powerful organic nutrients is so important for a healthy, productive garden. And especially at the end of the season, your tomato plant, like mine, is probably running out of gas and needs some more food. So I'm gonna feed it with my favorite organic nutrients, the first one being my good old homemade compost. If you don't have your own compost, you can use bag compost, but I'm just gonna add a handful or so at the base of my plant. You can also use some kind of organic bagged garden soil if you don't have any compost available to you at all. Now the second nutrient I love to add to my garden is a good organic fertilizer. I love to use Trifecta Plus. It's a good multi-purpose fertilizer, very powerful. I'm gonna add about a fourth of a cup at the base of the plant and kind of scratch it in. It has good slow release as well as quick release nutrients that will feed my tomato plant right away. Now again, if you watched my Feeding Your Garden series, we learned all about worm tea and earthworm castings by Vermistera. So I'm gonna apply some Vermistera worm castings. It actually now comes in a smaller two pound bag, which makes it very convenient if you just wanna try it out for the very first time. And I'm just gonna add a couple of tablespoons at the base of the plant and scratch it right in. The fourth nutrient that I'm gonna to add to my plant to water it all in and soak it well down into the roots is the Vermistera worm tea. I absolutely love worm tea. I feed my entire garden with worm tea about once a month. And I just added about three ounces to this gallon and a half watering can. And worm tea has so many beneficial bacteria and microbes and it really has contributed to the health and productivity of my garden. 
use whatever fertilizers you prefer, but your tomatoes will definitely need some good nutrition to get them pumping again here at the end of the season. These are the fertilizers I have tested in my garden and used over time and found that they really, really work to help my plants be healthy and productive. Now, all the links, including how to get a 10% discount, will be in the video description below if you're interested in using them in your garden as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed the tips I shared here in the video. Comment below. Let me know if you'll be using any of these tips to get some more production out of your tomato plants after a heat wave or just here at the end of the season. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and have your notifications turned on so that way you get notified whenever I post a new video or whenever I go live on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. everyone. Today we're going to talk about what to do with those tomato plants at the end of the growing season. Now if you live in a colder climate and your first frost date is approaching or if you're in a warmer climate like I am and your tomato plants are reaching the end of their production and just looking pretty worn out from a long hot summer then you want to stay tuned to this video for a few tips. Tomato plants definitely have a life cycle. They love the warm summer months. The temperatures of 65 to 85 or 90 degrees, they really thrive under those conditions. But they're cold sensitive plants. Once the cold weather hits and the frost hits, they're pretty much done. Well, several of you northern gardeners who live in a cold winter climate have mentioned to me how sad you are that your summer growing season of all those wonderful warm weather vegetables, including tomatoes, is coming to an end. Maybe you've already had a frost your area or maybe you have a frost coming very soon or maybe you're a southern gardener like I am and it's just been a brutal hot maybe windy summer tomato plants are looking pretty bad no more tomatoes left on them and you're ready to take them out and replace them with some more cold tolerant vegetables that can give you some food over the winter time whatever the case might be if your tomato plant is looking like this it's time to take it out, either winterize your garden bed or make room for some more vegetables. Now before you completely remove your tomato plant, you definitely want to harvest all of those tomatoes, the red ones and the green ones. You definitely don't want to let any of them go to waste. Now I'm going to harvest the red ones and also harvest the green ones and they'll easily ripen up indoors just by putting them in a paper sack, sealing it up within a week or so, you're gonna have some yourself some beautiful red ripe tomatoes to enjoy even when the weather's cold out. Gotta love it, right? I grew up gardening in a large family of seven kids and we had a humongous garden. And one thing my mom did, I always remember this, is she pulled up the entire tomato plant with tons of green tomatoes and hung it upside down in our basement. And believe it or not, those tomatoes ripened and we could go and pick them in the winter time. Now, I don't have the space to do that in my house, but if you have a big basement and a cool, darker, dry place in your house that you can hang an entire tomato plant, then I want you to do that and comment below and let me know how it works for you, okay? Now, the cool thing about this method is you don't even need any light. You just need a dark basement or a garage, but you do need temperatures of around 60 to 72 degrees in order for your tomatoes to ripen. How fun would it be to go down into your basement in the winter time and pick some ripe tomatoes? Well, whether you've harvested your tomatoes because you're afraid of frost and damaging them or you just want to make room for more plants like I am, hopefully you got a bigger harvest than I have. I mean, the heat has just really shut my tomato plants down. This is super simple to do. You just want to take a nice sharp pair of pruners and just cut the tomato plant at the base of the stem. And you can either remove the whole cage with the entire plant in it or just remove the plant and leave the cage, which is what I'm going to do. because so I'm going to go ahead and plant some other vegetables at the base of this cage. I mean, how much easier can it get? I already have a cage in here, but I'm going to plant some peas, which will climb up over this cage during the winter time and give me some more food to harvest over the winter. Now once you've taken out your tomato plants, do not dispose of them in the compost pile. You want, definitely want to throw them away in your green trash can because tomatoes tend to carry a lot of diseases such as blight and funguses and all kinds of things like that. And you don't want that spreading to the rest of your garden when you compost it. These tomato plants have been with me all summer. It's always kind of sad to take them out. I mean, do you guys ever feel that way? Now what you can do if you want to is add some shredded leaf mulch or plant some cover crops, which we'll cover in another video, to your garden beds. 
And what this does is just help prevent against erosion over the winter time. And huge thing here, guys. It also adds organic material to your soil, brings in the worms, and that way, when it comes time for spring planting, you'll be a jump ahead. Now for you southern gardeners who live in a more mild winter climate, don't take out your tomato plants just because the colder months are coming and it's the end of the season. If you still have some nice looking plants like this one behind me that has a lot of green tomatoes on it, I would go ahead and leave it in and you might be able to get it to overwinter. Now key with this is keep it trimmed up, keep it fertilized, give it that good old tomato boost I talked about in a previous video, and keep an eye on the weather. If you're expecting a frost, even a light frost, you may want to come out and cover your plants either with a frost blanket or with some heavy plastic to help protect it from the frost because the frost will definitely damage it. But although your production might slow down in the winter time, there's nothing more fun than coming out into your garden when the weather is chilly and picking yourself a nice red tomato. And by the way, if you do need to cover your plant with plastic, make sure you remove it when the sun comes out so your plant doesn't fry as it gets a little bit warmer during the day. Thank you so much for spending time out here in the garden with me today. It's always a lot of fun. Well, I hope you found this video helpful and now know what to do with your tomato plants at the end of the season. Whether you're expecting frost and planning on taking them out or whether you're hoping to overwinter a few. So share this video with a friend, subscribe if you haven't already, and comment below. Let me know how your tomato plants are doing. I'd love to hear about it. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. everyone well today I wanted to bring you a Cali Kim quick garden tip and it has to do with how to ripen a green tomato off the vine now you might ask why in the world would I want to do this tomatoes are best if they're ripened fully ripened on the vine nice and sweet just like these are right here they look beautiful red ripe and juicy but sometimes you need to ripen them off the vine if you have to pick them early because you have a frost coming up or if you like me you have a problem with garden pests that are eating your plants you want to pick them early as soon as they start to turn which is exactly what I'm going to do today I have one here that's just at first blush let me pick it here for you so you can see still really green just starting to turn and I'm also going to pick a tomato that's very green while well, this one came right off this one actually has a few claw marks on it which I don't like to see but these will both ripen, believe it or not, nice and red and juicy, just like these ones behind me with this simple tip. All you need is a paper sack. And here I have a large size grocery sack, a Trader Joe's brown grocery bag. You can use a small grocery bag. It really just depends on how many tomatoes you want to ripen. It's really easy. I mean, there's really nothing to it. You simply <laughs> put the tomatoes in the bag. There we have it. And you fold the bag over. There we have it. And the third thing is you let it sit for a couple of days. Super easy, super quick. And what this does is the tomatoes will release ethylene gas as they ripen. The paper bag simply provides a spot for the ethylene gas to stay and stay concentrated in the bag to hasten the ripening process. Now there's nothing magical about a paper bag but a paper bag is porous, allows the tomatoes to breathe so they won't spoil. Obviously a plastic bag won't do that, but it's really the ethylene gas that's helping them ripen quicker. Now let me just show you a couple tomatoes I've had in here for a few days, how wonderfully ripe they look. Ooh, this one's like getting a little bit overripe. This is an Amish paste, and I'm not too sure what this one is. It might have come off this early girl plant, but look, they're beautifully red and juicy. This one's definitely oozing with juice, ready to be eaten. And I promise you guys, I picked these when they were just about looking like this, and they ripened up beautifully. So super quick, easy, simple trick. And you might need this as the winter and fall approaches and you have to get these green tomatoes off your tomato plant before the frost gets them. All right, guys, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Everyone, well, in this episode, no, I'll start over again. We're doing this quick garden.
Hi everyone. Well, I thought I'd bring you guys along today for my harvest. I love harvesting what I've grown. So exciting, so much fun to see how everything looks out here. And I also want to do a quick little garden to table recipe at the end of the video. When you don't have a lot of time, but you have a lot that you need to cook and process, this is a great way to be able to eat what you've grown. So let's go. One of the most exciting things for me to pick in the garden is my tomatoes. I've got a couple over here, my early girl tomato and rising trout. Look at this guys, this is such a cool little tip that I got from Jazzy Julie over on Instagram. We have so much good discussion over there, but I was having problems with this plant getting eaten by rats and she suggested that I put knee high pantyhose over the fruit. Look at that one, it looks perfect. And since I did that, I haven't gotten any eaten by rats, so I think I'm gonna keep doing that to some of my prized tomatoes that I especially want to protect. So I'm gonna get the early girls and the rising traps picked, and then we're gonna move on to my very favorite tomato. This is my very favorite tomato, guys. I absolutely love this tomato. It's a Kellogg's breakfast. And funny enough, I actually thought I planted a rising traub here, but it turned out to be a Kellogg's breakfast tomato. So I covered this one with pantyhose as well. I didn't want the birds to get it. Let's unveil it here. Oh, wow. It's even starting to split a little bit. Oh, this is so beautiful. Look at this. I love this tomato. I cannot wait to eat it. It's just perfect and juicy and ripe. Looks absolutely beautiful. All right, we're gonna move on to the peppers now. Okay, this is where I did my pepper boost just a week ago, and these plants are looking fabulous, absolutely loaded with peppers. I've got some Jimmy Nardellas, which you guys know are my absolute favorite kind. I've got an albino pepper right up here in front. This is gonna be so good in our, our meal tonight, in our garden to table recipe that I'll show you guys at the end here. Sorry, here's my albino pepper. This is so cute, you can see how it got its name. Got an orange bell back here. Wow, this orange bell is looking beautiful. I don't think I've ever grown orange bells like this. This is absolutely amazing. And I think I have another one down here. Well, that one's not quite ready. And back here, I've got some hot peppers. These are Hungarian wax peppers. Couple in here, and this is actually, since I did the pepper boost a week ago, forming new flowers, and I got a second crop coming on. Got some strawberries to pick here, and these aren't even gonna make it into the house. Mmm, that's good. Ooh. Oh, they're so yummy. One more that's ready. I'm not gonna tell Drew about these. Mmm. Nothing like snacking in the garden. Last thing to harvest today is my green and purple beans. And the great thing about beans is the more you pick them, the more they grow. I love these purple ones, they're so pretty. Look at my beautiful harvest. Oh, this looks so great. I'm gonna go inside and get ready to eat. I love this recipe because it is so simple. All I've done is sliced up these veggies. I put the tomatoes in one bowl and the other firmer vegetables in the other bowl, like the peppers, the zucchini, and I even found an eggplant out front. It's absolutely gorgeous. All I did, guys, is so easy. I just put some olive oil, some fresh ground pepper, some garlic powder, and some Himalayan pink sea salt. And if you guys haven't tried this, this stuff is amazing. So I did all that, threw it in a bowl, threw some olive oil in, just got in here and mixed it up really well. And I put my tomatoes in a separate bowl because they kind of tend to fall apart with the other ones. All I'm going to do is just lay down on a cookie sheet. This is like basically roasting vegetables. Lay them out on a cookie sheet. Doesn't really matter if they're, you know, nice and neat and pretty. Um, you want to kind of spread them out if you can. But we're going to lay it on the cookie sheet. We're just going to roast it in a 400 degree oven for about 20 to 30 minutes till they look nice and brown and crispy. And I even like to throw them in the broiler because that makes it really crispy and really brown and just gives that nice extra special crunch. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then I'm gonna show you what it looks like. We're gonna do the taste test. It's amazing. 
These look absolutely amazing. I just pulled them out of the oven. They were in at 400, actually for about 30 minutes, and then I put them on broil for about 10 minutes. And oh my gosh, I wish you guys could smell this. It smells amazing. These tomatoes, I love how they're just barely blackened around the edges. That's how I like them. The great thing about this is you can put the seasonings on them that you like and cook it to how you like it. And the eggplant and zucchini and peppers, just that little bit of blackened really bring, brings out the flavor. Now I've got to try these. These taste or smell absolutely incredible. This is such a simple meal. What we like to do is just pile these high on our plate. And then if you want to, you can add a piece of chicken or a piece of salmon. But the more veggies, the better, and oh, I don't even know if I can wait for these to cool down. This is so amazing. I gotta, get, I gotta taste one here. I know they're gonna be super hot, and I'll probably burn my mouth on it, but. Ooh, it is hot, but. Mmm, mmm, that was zucchini. Oh, that was so good. I taste the basil on it, the salt and pepper, the garlic. I gotta try tomato, though. Oh, that is so good. Oh my gosh, that blackened part just gives a crunch and brings out the flavor and the sweetness of the tomato. You've got to try this. Leave me a, a comment below. If you try this with your veggies or if you're gonna try it with your veggies, let me know how it turns out. And let me know your favorite tips for quick roasting your veggies or preserving a big harvest that you bring in from the outside. Guys, this is incredible. This is my favorite quick tip for a little garden to table dinner. Mmm, delicious. All right, guys, thank you so much for enjoying my harvest and my quick meal with me. We'll see you guys on the next video. Hi, everyone. Here is Callie Kim's two minute tip for today tomatoes. Hopefully at this point in the summer, you have lots and lots of them to harvest in your garden. But the problem is what to do with all of these tomatoes. A good problem to have, right? Today I'm going to share with you two very quick and easy things you can do with your abundance of tomatoes so you have garden fresh tomatoes to eat all year round when it's too cold to grow them in your garden. Well, the first very quick and simple thing you can do with your tomatoes is just to freeze them whole. Just pick them off the vine, wash them, pat them dry, pop them whole into a freezer bag, get all the air out of the freezer bag you can, I like to use a straw for this, seal the bag and pop them in a freezer. You can pull them out later and they'll be perfect for sauces, soups and salsas and you'll be enjoying that garden fresh taste all year long. The second thing you can do with those loads of tomatoes you're growing in your garden is to oven dry them. Oven drying concentrates the flavor, brings out the sweetness, and eating one is like eating a little bit of summer sunshine. It works well with the cherry tomatoes, the smaller varieties. Wash your tomatoes, pat them dry, cut them in half, drizzle them with a little bit of olive oil, sprinkle with sea salt, fresh ground pepper, some chopped garden fresh herbs. Place them on a cookie sheet lined with parchment paper in a 225 degree oven for about six hours. Once they've completely dried, put them in a candy jar or pop them in a freezer bag and place them in the freezer so you can pull them out later to have that garden fresh goodness in your recipes. Well, I hope these tips have been helpful so you know what to do with all those garden tomatoes you're growing so you have that garden fresh tomato flavor all year long. Comment below, let me know your favorite thing to do with your garden fresh tomatoes. Subscribe, share, and we'll see you on the next Cali Kim two minute tip. Hi everyone. Well, do you ever harvest something from your garden that is just absolutely amazingly beautiful that you don't even want to eat it? Well, I did that the other day. This Kellogg's breakfast tomato. I honestly didn't even know it was there because it was under my pantyhose protectors that I put on my prized tomatoes to protect them from the squirrels. And look at this guys. Absolutely beautiful. I honestly didn't even want to pick it, but I know that's crazy because it would spoil. But I'm going to make something for you today that's going to be quick, simple, easy, and absolutely delicious. Well, you guys might have seen me harvest this tomato on Instagram the other day. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. This is my very favorite Kellogg's breakfast tomato. Love these tomatoes. They're sweet, they're juicy, they're large, and this is by far the largest one I've ever had in my garden and probably one of the most beautiful tomatoes I've ever seen. Hopefully the color comes through on camera, but it's beautifully orange. It's very soft and juicy, and I can't wait 
to make the recipe I'm gonna make today because it's one of my favorites and I haven't made it yet this season. It's called Salsa Fresca. It's a fresh, raw, uncooked salsa, super quick to make. Uses different kinds of tomatoes and peppers and cilantro and really rounds out the flavor with all those different types of vegetables. So let me go over the ingredients that I'm gonna be using today and how I like to make it. You can customize it to your taste, but today what I'm gonna do, of course, my prize ingredient, my Kellogg's breakfast. I have a couple other tomatoes, the Rutgers tomato, my uh, morning sun tomato, my um, Jimmy Nardello peppers, which is one of my favorite types of peppers, a sweet pepper, it's delicious. I also have a couple of varieties of hot peppers, a hot banana pe pepper, which I have already chopped up here, and some small little tiny five color peppers they're called. These are super fire hot. And if you like it spicy, you're gonna to wanna to add several hot peppers. I'm gonna add a couple of these because camera guy doesn't like it too spicy, so I'll add more to mine. Of course, a really nice handful of cilantro. I like a lot, the more the merrier, but of course, do it to your taste. I've got some red onion. I've got some chopped avocado here, and the seasonings I'm using is a fresh um, ground pepper, which I like to use fresh ground. And one of my very favorite things I've been cooking with lately is a Himalayan pink sea salt. It's absolutely as the flavor over the top. Cumin is one of my favorite flavors when I'm cooking my salsa fresca. And of course, you can't forget the fresh lime juice. Oh my gosh, this tomato is so pretty. I hate to cut it. <laughs> but I know if I want to eat it, I have to cut it. Well, here goes. This is so beautiful. Okay, slice away. Wow, look at that juicy flesh. <laughs> this tomato is gorgeous. It's just dripping with juice. Oh, the sweetness, the color is amazing. Have you guys ever had a tomato like that that you just don't want to even eat from the garden? <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. But it's just such a beautiful color. Mmm. <laughs> oh, it's so good. You guys caught me. I couldn't wait for a taste. Oh, wow. It's like a flavor explosion. Okay, this recipe is so easy. I even hate to call it a recipe, but the only thing you have to do is dump all of your ingredients in a bowl. I've got my different kinds of tomatoes here. My peppers I'm gonna dump in, my red onion. And I forgot to mention, I have a little minced garlic here as well. My avocado. So you just slide everything into a bowl. My cilantro, I'm just gonna go ahead and dump it all in because I love cilantro. There we go. And of course, like I said, my prize ingredient. Here it goes guys, my Kellogg's breakfast tomato. The colors of this are absolutely gorgeous. That's one reason why I like it. I absolutely love garden color. And mix it up. Wow. Oh my gosh. Look at these colors. They're absolutely fabulous. I know I get really kind of overly excited over the top about this stuff, but I absolutely love it. Now I'm gonna spice it up with some fresh ground pepper. And you do this all to taste, my pink Himalayan salt. Now, what I found with pink Himalayan salt is it's really salty, so you definitely wanna be careful when you add it and taste it as you go. And this is my cumin. And my lime juice, which I've already squeezed. Definitely add the lime juice, that adds so much flavor. It's definitely a key ingredient. Okay, that's all there is to it, guys. Less than five minutes to mix it up, and you've got a beautiful salsa fresca. We're just gonna eat this tonight like a salad. I'm not even gonna eat it with chips. We're having our fresh zucchini lasagna from the garden. This will be our side dish. And of course, I've gotta give it the taste test. Can't wait till dinner time. I'm just gonna eat it right out of the bowl, okay? I'm gonna get a little bit of everything in there, the cilantro, the different kinds of tomatoes, the peppers. Oh my gosh, beautiful. Mmm, 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 mmm. Wow, this is every bit as good as I thought it would be. 
all those garden fresh flavors come through. The flavor, I can't even explain it. You absolutely have to try it. Okay guys, I've been really excited to share this recipe with you. Let me know if you try it. Add whatever garden ingredients you have, whatever peppers, whatever tomatoes, whatever you have in your garden can go in this very simple recipe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Wow, look at this big paste tomato. I just picked a bunch of my, uh, my paste tomatoes and I finally have enough between these and what I have in the freezer to make spaghetti sauce. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. I'm gonna use a combination of fresh tomatoes and frozen tomatoes and show you how to make a really easy spaghetti sauce recipe that you can use in all kinds of things. You can freeze it, you can can it if you want. So let's go inside and we'll get started. I'm so excited about the spaghetti sauce. It's so delicious and my paste tomatoes have been a little late this year. So I can't wait to get my sauce made. All right, you guys, this is it. This is gonna be fun. Well, making fresh spaghetti sauce from my homegrown tomatoes is most definitely my favorite way to use my tomatoes. And today I'm using a combination of fresh tomatoes I just picked from the garden and frozen tomatoes that I froze maybe a month or so ago. I'm gonna show you how to process both into the spaghetti sauce. There's a few simple ingredients that I use in my spaghetti sauce. Olive oil, parsley, salt and pepper, sugar, garden fresh oregano, garden fresh parsley, garlic, tomato paste, and my secret ingredient, zucchini, which my kids don't know about, so please don't tell them. So let's get started. We'll come over to the sink and take a look at the uh, frozen tomatoes, and I'll show you how to get the skins off in a really easy way. Okay, let's go. Okay, I've got my frozen tomatoes here in the sink. They've been thawing out for a couple of hours, and it is so easy to get the skins off the frozen tomatoes. These are kind of halfway thawed, and look how easily the skin just peels right off. And I'll just throw this skin into my compost pile. Just comes right off. It's so simple. It's almost easier to do it when they're partially frozen. So for me, I like to have about five Ziploc bags full of frozen tomatoes to make my spaghetti sauce. And then of course we're adding fresh today. So it just peels right off. Then I put it into the bowl to let it drain out a little bit more. So I'm going to go ahead and de-skin these five bags of tomatoes and we'll come back and show you what to do next. Okay, I'm done peeling all these frozen tomatoes and what I forgot to mention earlier is you want to peel them and then put them in a colander in the sink and let them drain. That way all the excess water, um, all the excess juice, everything will drain out. We want to get them as drained as possible before we put them into our spaghetti sauce. So you just want to let them drain in the sink here for a little while. And then right now, but since I'm doing fresh tomatoes also, I'm going to move on to the fresh tomatoes and show you how we process these. These are some pretty good sized Amish paste tomatoes. Um, they're like aroma tomato. They're really nice in sauce. And I'm going to show you how to get the skin off really easy. But before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and cut the cores out. Okay? So let me go ahead and do that and then we'll come back and show you how to get the skins off. Okay, a super easy way to peel fresh tomatoes is just dunk them in boiling water for about 30 seconds. The skins will kind of peel up and you're gonna pull them out or I'll pull them out and put them in this bowl here and you'll see the skins will just like peel right off. So let those sit for a little bit and come back and show you what they look like. So it's been about 30 seconds and you can see how the skin is just peeling right off. So I'm just gonna pull these out and put them in a bowl here, let them cool a little bit then we'll peel the skins right off and we can use them in our spaghetti sauce. Okay, and look how easily this skin just peels right off after that little dunk in the boiling water. Just makes it so easy. Don't need to use a knife or anything, just get your hands in there. And there you go. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and peel these and we'll come back with the next step in the recipe. Okay, I've got my two uh, different groups of tomatoes here. 
This is the, the bowl that was frozen, a couple different varieties of tomatoes, and this is the bowl that was fresh. They're both peeled, they're ready to go. You can see in here I've got some orange tomatoes. These are my Kellogg's breakfast tomatoes. They're nice and sweet, and they really add a good flavor to the sauce. So what I'm gonna do now is, because we do like a thinner sauce, we don't like a real chunky sauce, I'm gonna go ahead and puree these in my blender before we cook them in the stock pot. So I'm gonna go ahead and get them all blended up. I just throw them in here, and I actually just pulse them a little bit. Um, so there are you know, a few little chunks, but for the most part, it's pretty well blended up. So I'll go ahead and get that done, and then come back and show you what we do next. Okay, we've got the tomatoes all pureed in the blender. Now, if you don't mind a chunky sauce, you can skip the blender step altogether and just mash your tomatoes up with a potato masher in a bowl. That works just fine too. So now we're gonna finally, after we've processed all these tomatoes, we're gonna start cooking our sauce, the moment we've been waiting for. So let's go to the stove and I'll show you what to do next. My big stock pot here, I put about a half a cup of olive oil in the bottom Got it nice and hot, and I've got about maybe five or six cloves of garlic, which I'm gonna get in the pot here, and just kind of brown it. This is gonna give the spaghetti sauce some really nice flavor. We'll do this before we add any of the tomatoes in. So you're gonna brown this. Oh, it smells so good. It's getting nice and brown. And then I'm gonna get the tomatoes and just start pouring the tomato sauce in. We'll grab the tomatoes over here and start pouring them in. You have to be careful because it kind of splatters. So <laughs> That wasn't pretty, but it got the first batch in there. So I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of the tomato sauce in here, and I'll come back and show you all the seasonings that we put in. Okay, we got all the tomatoes added to the sauce, and my secret ingredient is zucchini. Now, I love to add zucchini to my spaghetti sauce because not only does it add a lot of flavor, but it's one great way to get zucchini into my kids without them realizing. So I've got about two cups of zucchini. I'm just gonna pour it right in. Once the sauce gets all mixed up and, and cooked, it's gonna be totally invisible. Now you can see this sauce is kind of a light red color, and that's because of all the different tomatoes that I add. And um, to help it get that nice deep dark red color that I really like, I am gonna add one can of tomato paste. Now it's not really gonna affect the taste too much. You're still gonna have that great homegrown taste that's gonna come through. But not only does it help thicken up the sauce, but it will also help um, give that deep dark red color to my sauce. Because I don't take all the seeds out of my tomatoes, this sauce, um, while you're cooking it, it is gonna be quite thin. Uh, but I just don't like to seed it all and I cook it, you know, I cook it down so that it ends up being a lot thicker in the end. So we've got the tomato paste in there. We'll stir that in. Then we'll add our seasonings. It's important while you're making the spaghetti sauce just to know that you're going to be adding your seasonings to taste. So I know the quantities here aren't real exact, but I do make a big huge stock pot full of spaghetti sauce whenever I make my spaghetti sauce. You can certainly make a much smaller quantity if you want. So I add you know, probably more seasonings than what you would add. But I'm gonna put like a handful of so, or so of salt. It's probably um, maybe a tablespoon. Put in some fresh ground pepper. And spice it up here. I'm gonna add some parsley. And unfortunately I don't have any parsley from my garden so I have to use the dry parsley. Okay, I do have oregano from my garden. I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons of fresh oregano. And I've got some fresh basil from my garden, so I'll add a couple of tablespoons of the fresh basil. And You're gonna also wanna add a couple of tablespoons of sugar. The sugar will help counter out the, counteract the acid in the tomatoes. And once again, you'll do this to taste, so you'll add a little bit of sugar, as with all your spices and seasonings, and then taste it. You might have to add a little bit more. And we're gonna stir this up, let it simmer for a while, and then taste it, 
and see how it's coming along. So come back. Okay, so my spaghetti sauce has been simmering now for maybe a half hour or so, and I'm gonna give it a taste test to see what other spices I need to add to it. Now, as I'm boiling, I'm leaving the lid off because I do want it to reduce down. As you can see, it's really thin. And I'm gonna cook it, actually, for a couple of hours. But if I cook it with the lid on, it's gonna get all that condensation, which will add more moisture to my sauce. So let's give it a taste and see what else I need. It's pretty good, but I think I definitely need to add some more garlic. In fact, I'll probably add more spices all the way around. And this is why it's so important to add a little bit and then taste it. Just add a little bit at a time and then taste it and keep doing that throughout the cooking process because your tastes are gonna be different than mine. We like a lot of garlic, but maybe you don't. So I just added about three cloves of garlic, three more cloves of garlic. And it also depends on the quantity that you're making too. If you're making a smaller quantity, you're obviously gonna need much less spices. I'm also gonna add some basil did a video earlier on drying basil, and this is basil from my garden, but just dried, dehydrated, dehydrating in the microwave, and then put it in the freezer. So I'm gonna go ahead and rub it between my hands to make it a little bit finer to add to my sauce, and add some of it. I'm also gonna add a little bit more oregano. Now, I don't have any fresh oregano left, but again, this is um, oregano that is dehydrated from my garden. Just gonna add it right in there and maybe even a little more salt and pepper. Okay, just adding again a little bit at a time and then we're gonna come back and taste it after it's had a chance to simmer and get all those flavors infused throughout the sauce. Well, the sauce has been simmering for about three hours now. It's starting to look really good. It's starting to thicken up a little bit. And I've actually added some more seasonings. I added some more basil, some more oregano, and probably about a fourth a cup of sugar. And now I'm gonna taste it, and we'll see if it's ready to eat. Oh, and you can see how the level in the pot has actually gone down a little bit. That means it is thickening up. You can actually cook this all day if you want, but I'm gonna taste it and see if it's ready to eat now. Oh, it smells so, so good. It has a nice, beautiful red color. There's lots of nice looking seasonings and spices in there. Oh, it's gonna be really hot. Wow, that homegrown tomato taste is really coming through. This stuff is ready for eating. So let me show you how I like to eat spaghetti sauce. One of my favorite ways to eat my homemade spaghetti sauce is with zucchini noodles. Now you might ask, what is a zucchini noodle? Well, I don't like to eat a lot of pasta. I like to keep my carbs real low. So I make zucchini noodles from my big, huge zucchini like this simply by taking a potato peeler and going around my zucchini just turning it as I peel. This is so good. And before you know it, you've got a nice little pile of zucchini noodles. Okay. It's really, really good. So I'm going to just ladle a little bit of sauce on top. And the sauce is so hot right now, it's going to kind of cook the noodles a little bit. Sometimes I will put the noodles into the microwave for just a few minutes if my sauce isn't quite as hot but this sauce has been boiling for three hours and boy, does it smell good. Just ladle some on top, put a little Parmesan cheese on. Better than spaghetti. Can't wait to try this stuff. It's definitely a labor of love. It's not hard, it's just time consuming. These noodles are a little bit long. <laughs> Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. Wow, this sauce is so, so good. I also love to use it as pizza sauce. Make my own pizza dough and put that this sauce on top. It is delicious. Now, I've got this big, huge pot. Obviously, I'm not going to use it all right away. So what I'm going to do is put it into quart-sized freezer bags Lay it flat on a tray, freeze it, stick it in the freezer till, and have it all winter long. So thanks a lot for watching. I hope you get to try this wonderful homemade spaghetti sauce. Let me know how yours turns out. This stuff is so, so good.
Mm. It's great. Thanks for watching. See you later.